and a cluster of red brick buildings overlooking a neighborhood in South St. Louis, there is one of those buildings towering above the rest. Painted on that building, one sign stands taller than the others and cannot be covered up. It is visible from all parts of the nearby metropolis. At the tallest point of the brewery, a bold white set of letters spelling out LEMP is painted on dark red bricks. Although it just has four letters, those letters say plenty about St. Louis's lore and history and ghosts that just won't die. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. The Tipsy Ghost is a riff off of a drink crafted by a website called Shake, Drink, Repeat, which I've linked in the description box. It looks like the creator developed it in 2021, so another new treat. I've made some alterations in mine, and when I said that this is one of the best drinks I've ever made, I'm not lying. If you like coconut, you're going to love this drink. And the best part is that it is pure white like a ghost. (laughs) I have made it for myself several times since I adapted it for this episode, and it's going to be in my repertoire for regular drinks I make forever. So if you like ghosts, coconut, and boozy drinks out of a beaker, then this is the one for you. For the cocktail today, take two parts coconut rum, one part whipped cream vodka, and two parts coconut cream, and add to a shaker with ice. The coconut cream you can buy in a can from any grocery store, and when I put it into the shaker, I thought it looked slimy, but once it's shaken, it makes the drink the perfect color for a ghost. Speaking of shaken, shake those ingredients very well and then strain over fresh ice and top with lemon lime soda of your choice. I used Sprite. For the mocktail, take one part rum syrup, link in bio, three parts coconut cream, and add those to your shaker with ice. Shake, strain, and top with Sprite, and if you're feeling fancy, a bit of whipped cream. You'll be back for a second soon enough, trust me. St. Louis has been known as Beer City since at least 1809, when a merchant named John Coons opened a crude brewery on the banks of the Mississippi. In the last 200 years, the St. Louis area has been home to more than 200 breweries. At least one you may have heard of the Bavarian Brewery, which eventually became the Anheuser-Busch Brewery, was established in 1852 in St. Louis. Another, which you may not have heard of, was a brewery started by a German immigrant named Adam Lemp. In 1836, 38-year-old Adam Lemp, who had learned the brewer's trade in Eschwege, Germany, immigrated to America, leaving behind his wife and infant son. He opened a small general store in St. Louis in 1838, but he also started brewing and making small batches of beer and vinegar. His beer, not his vinegar, became increasingly popular with the influx of other German immigrants to St. Louis. His first brewery, called the Western Brewery, was on the site of the now Gateway Arch. And for a few years, he sold his beer at an attached pub called Lemp's Hall. It is possible that he was the first to brew lager beer in the United States. Lager quickly became king in St. Louis, partially due to the Germans drinking it and partially due to the fact that it could be stored for longer. And because St. Louis was built on top of a natural cave system, the beer, which needed to be kept cool during fermentation, could be done so easily in the warmer months. If you didn't know, St. Louis has more caves beneath its streets than any other city on earth. In 1848, Adam brought his wife Justine and then 12-year-old son William to St. Louis. He and Justine would have two more children before Justine's death six years later of yellow fever. Adam would later remarry a woman named Louise Bauer, who helped raise the children. By 1850, Western Brewery was one of the largest breweries in the city. I don't know if I'm going to be able to say brewery this whole time. It's come back a lot, so just so you know. Anyway... (laughs) Western Brewery was big, and it would only get bigger with the outbreak of the War of Attempted Secession. The Civil War was a boon to the entirety of the brewing industry in St. Louis. St. Louis was a major transit point for troops moving to and from enemy territory. Thus, many captives, injured men, refugees, fugitive and liberated slaves, camp followers, merchants, and others related to the conflict found their way there. 
those in need of or offering their services as bricklayers, blacksmiths, carpenters, or stable hands also flocked to the area. Military personnel patrolled the western perimeter of the city, which included the harbor, railroad, warehouses, and arsenal. And all of them, as you can imagine, needed booze. St. Louis had lots of beer. A Civil War physician would write, quote, I've never seen a city where there is as much drinking of liquor as here. Everybody, almost, drinks, end quote. I mean, it was the middle of the Civil War. I'd be drinking a lot, too. Plus, beer would cost you a nickel a glass or just under a dollar, and that came with a free lunch. And it was pretty well known that Lemp made the best brew in town. Adam Lemp died in 1862, leaving the brewing business to his son, William, who was 26 at the time. A newlywed, William had married Julia Feichert, the daughter of a St. Louis saloon owner. Their first child would die at birth the same year that William lost his father. William almost immediately took a break from brewing to join the Union, where he was a part of several bloody conflicts. Upon his return, the stout five-foot, one-inch William was resolute in making the Lemp Brewing Company the largest and best in St. Louis. He bought an entire city block and constructed huge brick buildings that would house all parts of the brewery. By 1877, he had the largest brewery in St. Louis and the 19th largest in the entire world. Anheuser-Busch, for comparison, at that same time was 32nd in the world. Just down the street on Demenel Place, William bought a huge brick house and turned it into a house for his family that by now had six children. It had 33 rooms and was a showplace of the Gilded Age. There was an open-air elevator, three massive fireproof vaults, and an atrium with exotic birds. Julia, William, and their six children lived in the lap of luxury, no doubt. William had his own cave system right beneath the mansion and the brewing complex that he used for brewery operations until the late 1870s when mechanical refrigeration made the cave system unnecessary for that. Then those caves became an entertainment complex for the Lemp family. It had an entrance in the basement of the family mansion. There was a ballroom and another chamber was turned into a theater and the Lemps most likely hired actors to put on private performances there. There was also an underground swimming pool heated by hot water pumped in from the brewery's boiler house. The Lemp family could travel from their mansion to the brewery by way of the caves when the weather was rough outside. Frederick, the Lemp's fourth son, who had been named for family friend Frederick Pabst, yes, that Pabst, Frederick Lemp was William's favorite son, a fact that everyone knew. He was college educated and married to Irene Verdon and father of one daughter. Frederick, the favorite son, died of heart failure on December 12, 1901, when he was 28 years old, and that would be the moment when the Lemp family disintegrated. The brewery secretary would say, quote, suddenly the grief of the father was most pathetic. He took it so seriously that we feared that it would completely shatter his health and looked for the worst to happen, end quote. And the worst would happen. William became so depressed and his mental health demons took over so greatly that he refused to appear in public. He would choose the darkness of the caves to get to work at the brewery each day. He had constructed a family mausoleum to the tune of $2.3 million, $2023, and he would often visit his son who had been interred there. But after the death of Frederick's namesake on the 1st of January, 1904, the Pabst, William couldn't handle life anymore. Just a little over a month later, on February 13, 1904, just shy of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition or the St. Louis World's Fair, William Lemp completed suicide in his bedroom in the Lemp family mansion. The viewing took place in the mansion, and more than a thousand employees paid their respects there. At the time of his death, the combined worth of the brewery and his personal state was 540 million modern dollars. William Jr. was thrust into William Sr.'s place as the head of the Lemp Brewery. William Jr. was otherwise known as Billy. And there was no time to waste as the World's Fair was on its way. And listen, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Let's bring the World's Fair back. Who can I write to to make this happen? Billy was an eccentric, reckless man with an obsession with guns. He was a drinker and a fighter and passionate about women and horses. 
He had a home directly across the street from the Lemp Mansion, and despite his bachelor status, he did decide to get married on October 24th, 1899, in one of the most extravagant weddings in St. Louis history. But the marriage was doomed from the start, and the two fiercely independent, fiery-tempered people would end up divorced seven years later in a trial that was as fiery as their marriage. Billy would later remarry. Family matriarch Julia Lemp died after a battle with cancer on April 18, 1906 at home with her children at her side. The funeral for the richest woman in St. Louis was held at the mansion. Prohibition, which was officially ratified in 1919 but had been on the way for many years before, signaled the end of the legendary brewing empire Lemp Brewing Company. They tried creating something called near beer, a non-alcoholic malt brew they called Serva, which was apparently good, but wasn't enough to save the brewery. And Billy closed the doors officially on May 3rd, 1919. Luckily, the Limp family was rich enough to live comfortably without the beer production for generations. But comfortably and simply are two different things. On March 20th, 1920, Elsa Lemp Wright, William and Julia's youngest daughter, completed suicide by shooting herself in the head at her home at 13 Hortense Place in St. Louis. There is some controversy about her death, with some saying it was murder by her husband and not the officially listed cause of suicide. She did have depression, but did not, at least according to family and friends, seem suicidal. Billy, evidently upon hearing what happened, said, quote, that's the Limp family for you, end quote. On December 29th, 1922, Billy was at his office in the Limp Mansion in what is now the front left dining room, and he sent his wife downstairs to speak to the brewery architect and shot himself. Like his father and sister before him, he left no note or anything to say why he ended his own life. In 1929, Charles Limp, the third son of William and Julia, moved back into the Limp Mansion. Eccentric, the adjective of the day for the Lemp family, could also have been ascribed to Charles. But when he moved back home, his quirky side came out in full force. He only used round ice cubes because he hated the sound of ice clinking in the glass. No coffee in the house. Charles hated the smell. He showered five or six times a day, and any money he touched had to be washed. No shoes in the house, and the staff would polish your shoes before you left, even if you were a guest. Speaking of being a guest, if you were one, you had to wake up at the same time as Charles, 5 o'clock a.m. every day. As he got older, Charles got more reclusive and no guests were allowed at all. Charles also ended his own life in 1949 in his childhood home. He would be the fourth member of his immediate family to do so, all with guns and three of them in the Limp Mansion. Charles would be the only one to leave a suicide note writing, quote, in case I am found dead, blame it on no one but me, end quote. Okay. After Charles' suicide, the mansion was sold and turned into a boarding house. Then it was abandoned and, well, was becoming a ghost house. Neighbors would hear ghostly knocks and footsteps with no feet attached. Kids would sometimes sneak into the empty mansion and see, well, apparitions, it was purchased in the 1970s, and in the midst of remodeling, construction workers also reported ghostly encounters. They all said they felt like they were being watched. Tools would disappear and reappear in new places. Horse hooves were heard where no horses existed. Doors slammed left and right, and naturally unlocked and locked by themselves. It is said that when you enter the mansion, there is a heaviness, a feeling that you are not alone. When the newly remodeled restaurant and hotel opened in the mansion, staff members would see glasses lifted off the bar and flying around. The piano played by itself. In fact, no matter where the piano was placed, it was known to play. One night, bar patrons and the bartender saw water swirling around in a pitcher all by itself. An overnight guest reported waking up to see a woman in a long dress standing next to her bed. Before the only corporeal person in the room could react, the ghost went, shh, and vanished into thin air. A ghost hunter who had rented out the mansion one night felt something tapping on his shoulder and then grabbing it, and he could feel the individual fingers. Shadowed figures have been photographed in the mansion. Ghost hunters have been known to leave in the middle of the night, afraid of what they experience in the Lemp Mansion. Ghost hunters, literally hunters of ghosts, are scared. 
Today, that cave system running between the mansion and the long abandoned brewery buildings is also considered haunted. Shadowy flitting shapes have been seen and strange sounds have been reported coming from the cave. Someone once heard the sound of someone wearing hard-soled shoes behind him, and when he, understandably frightened, started to walk faster, the footsteps kept pace with him. When the man halted abruptly, the tapping sound continued for a few more steps before also stopping. Turning around and shining his flashlight, the man saw nothing behind him. My primary source for today's episode was a book called Suicide and Spirits, The True Story of the Rise and Fall of the Limp Empire by Troy Taylor. It's a heavily researched book that not only tells the story of the Lemps, but also St. Louis brewing as a whole, with some civil war and quite a bit of St. Louis cave history thrown in for important context and interest. You can get it on Kindle, too. I'll naturally link it in the description box. And there is no shortage of YouTube videos of ghost hunters telling about their experiences in the Lemp Mansion. It was enough to creep me out and I'm a thousand miles away. Edwin Lemp was the longest surviving child of William and Julia. He died of natural causes in 1970 at the age of 90. His final request to his caretaker was to have his paintings and treasures burned. Since around 1980, the 27 buildings that make up the Lemp Brewery Complex have been partially inhabited by a wide range of users, including those engaged in light industrial, commercial, and warehousing activities, as well as those in need of office space or studio space for creative pursuits. For numerous years in the 1990s, the building's massive underground cellars served as a Halloween haunted house and was rented out for rave events. The primary structure is empty at this point. The Lemp Mansion continues to draw ghost hunters and curiosity seekers alike and has been named one of CNN Travels' 10 spookiest buildings in the world. Seances have taken place often in the mansion since the 1970s, some of whom have claimed to have gotten in touch with at least one of the Lemp family members, Charles. According to one member of the Pointer family, the current owners of the Lemp Mansion, Restaurant, and Inn, quote, people come here expecting to experience weird things, and fortunately for us, they are rarely disappointed, end quote. You yourself can have the Lemp experience, where for $37 per person, you can explore the darkened Lemp Mansion with a paranormalist with an included infrared camera. Cash bar also available. And you can stay overnight for as little as 180 bucks. As much as I love capers and cocktails, I think I'll pass. Thanks for hanging out with me. I know this is said a lot, but I feel like the lesson I've learned the most in this story is that money doesn't solve all problems. It can't and doesn't make you happy, at least after a certain point. Maybe a more subtle way of looking at it. If you're rich and miserable, more money won't help. And our brains do not discriminate whether or not we are rich. Mental health issues can impact anyone. That we know for sure. Whether or not the Limp Mansion is haunted, well, I'll leave that for you to decide. Next week, I tell about a case that you've heard of, whether or not you know the details of it. We delve into why, in fact, Stockholm Syndrome is called Stockholm Syndrome, and we make a Swedish fish to enjoy while we do it, the alcoholic version. Head to Instagram and give me a follow, and I'll be the happiest little fish in the sea. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to staying the night in a haunted mansion.